Hey, thanks for joining me today for episode 52 of Podcasting Your Brand. I'm your host, producer Jemmy, providing learning lessons for you to podcast your brand. And today I'm going to share with you a podcasting 102 topic, creating great interview moments. This episode is brought to you by my own brand, Flintstone Media. Listen in and let's do this. I want to start today by telling you about the dirtiest look I have ever gotten from a co-host. I mean, ever. (laughs) Glenn the Geek and I were on one of our Finding Florida adventures, and it was essentially the last stop of the day. We were exhausted with one interview left, a chef at a totally cool and very yummy restaurant. But I was exhausted. Glenn was exhausted. And I'm not sure if it was my idea that I lead the interview or his, but whoever it was, it was a bad idea. (laughs) Bad idea. (laughs) Because did I mention I was exhausted? I mean, I had nothing left in the tank. And even though they gave us a five star four course meal with all the deliciousness you could imagine, which should have boosted me up, but it also included three (laughs) times. of wine so maybe that was the problem not looking back but anyways I was struggling to find a good starting point for the interview so I went with a common fallback I said so tell us how you became a chef and that's when I got the daggers (laughs) my co-host knew what was coming and as our guest chef began his story from practically his journey out of the womb It slowly dawned on me what I had done. (laughs) I just set us up for a very long and very unclear direction having story with a long wait until we could throw another oar into the water and move the conversation along. And with what energy, little energy I had left, it was completely zapped (laughs) out of both of us. Not because the story of his journey was inherently boring. It wasn't, not at all, but... It, number one, wasn't in keeping with our fast-paced, several stops and 60 or so minutes show, but also, two, it drastically handicapped our ability to create a pathway to a point. Instead, I started us down this road as wide as the desert (laughs) that could go in any direction. And that is one of the worst things you can do to start an interview, not give it any course of direction. And while it was a million times worse for us on that show, because it was a fast moving show and just not a great way to start any interview. But even when you have a show that does allow for a more full, long form, maybe 45 minute or so interview, it still doesn't work because it just doesn't give you any sense of direction. And that's the point I want to drive home at the beginning of this episode that the way you start an interview will set the direction and tone for everyone involved, not just your co-host who can shoot you daggers in real time, (laughs) but also for your guests. And of course, most importantly, for your listener who's coming along for the ride, completely trusting you to be a good navigator. So you have to find a good place to start. Otherwise, your listener will just get turned off. So while I could definitely share thoughts on how to start your episodes off, generally speaking, and I will on a future episode, I wanted to keep this episode within the scope of what we've been exploring these last few weeks, the interview. So how do you start an interview, Producer Jemmy? Great question. (laughs) There are two main approaches to starting an interview, at least two ways that will be the most productive. And if you have any other ideas or methods that I'm not sharing here, please feel free to reach out and share them with me. I'd love to bring them into the show. But the two main ways that I typically use are A, starting at quote unquote the beginning, but not not in the way I just explained. (laughs) I'll explain further. Or B, starting with a burning question. Okay, so the beginning. It means the beginning of whatever is relevant for that episode. Not, I repeat, not the beginning of their life since birth or whatever. (laughs) Again, my bad, Glenn. My bad. It'll never happen again. (laughs) But to give you a couple of examples of the good way to start at, quote unquote, the beginning... 
If you have a show about people thriving after a struggle, then start when that struggle began, when they got their diagnosis or when they got that eviction notice or when they learned that their identity had been stolen or when they entered foster care, et cetera, et cetera. You get the, you get the idea. If you have a show about animal rescue, I don't know why animal rescue almost is always one of my examples, but if you have a show about animal rescue, then start with when your guest first signed up to be a volunteer at the shelter or when they began their research into a better training solution or when they got their puppy as a kid and that started their whole inspiration of why they wanted to eventually volunteer in the first place or how they inherited the property that they turned into a shelter. Again, I'm sure you get the idea by now. So the beginning, to reiterate, it does not mean the beginning of their life ever. No, no, no. It means the beginning of the reason why you invited them to the show in the first place. So with that chef, (laughs) it would have been much better if I had asked why he decided on a more seasonal and artisan approach for his food or what first brought him into the doors to be the head chef at that restaurant in particular or something along those lines. So start at the beginning of where the story that you wanted to bring into the episode, the actual thing, the real meat, start at the beginning of that meat. (laughs) Alternatively, you can start with a burning question. Now, I don't mean to imply that a burning question needs to necessarily be something with shock value. It can be, but that's only a small part of what I'm talking about. Think of a burning question as something relating to a flashpoint in a person's life, something life-altering or impactful or unexpected or similar. So when I interviewed an author about the book she wrote in the aftermath of her son's nearly fatal accident, I asked her first to tell me a little bit about what her son was like before in order to honor his true self. And then I asked her to tell me about how that day started, the normalcy of taking him for a walk. And then I moved the conversation toward the moment she heard the screeching tires of the drunk driver. But I did not, however, ask for the whole familial backstory or her childhood journey, or anything that really took place before that critical moment in her life that was the subject of the interview. I started at the beginning of the relevant part. As another example, when speaking to a five-generation candy maker, I did ask for background on the family history because it was super relevant. That is the reason why I was interviewing him, because it was fascinating that they had been in this game for five years generations. And so I wanted to impress upon the listener just how deep those family roots went and to give context to his time at the company. And then I jumped ahead to his time there and some more recent changes in the business. So while the recent changes were interesting, the reason I reached out to him in the first place was because our listeners would be interested in knowing about a Florida family business whose roots went so far. And of course, it's always extra fun to talk about candy. So I definitely decided we would start the conversation going back many generations first in his case. So again, the bottom line for where to start your interviews is to start at the beginning of whatever is the reason you invited them on in the first place. Okay, now let's move into the meat of the interview. You have the conversation going and flowing. But remember when I advised you that as you prepare for your interviews or doing that research, to look for points of uniqueness in your guests and also points of either relation or difference or both between your guests and yourself and to have those ready to bring into the conversation. So here's what you do with them. Whether literally or figuratively, have those points of uniqueness and those points of relation and difference pinned off to the side of your desk or your mind, however you work. But there's something very special that can happen in a conversation when things get truly relatable between the host and the guest. Those moments are primed to elicit emotion, to make your listener laugh or cry or squirm or hold and catch their breath or to rethink their entire existence. Okay, maybe not so much that last one, but a conversation that brings out emotion is often the best kind of conversation. So hopefully in your prep, you were able to recognize and anticipate 
those compelling moments that may come up. Now, on episode 50, I shared my Miss Watermelon story, and that was definitely one that I had pinned off to the side of the conversation, hoping that I would find a good place to bring it in and that I would get a good laugh. And it worked. And that's essentially what you want to do. Watch for the opportunity for those moments and then bring up whatever note you have pinned off to the side. And it takes practice to be both present enough to notice when those opportunities come up and to be able to be mindful of that list of potential moments that you have, and then to be able to artfully bring it into the conversation. It does take practice, but it's definitely worth learning how to do it because it's awesome creating those moments when you can pull it off. But it doesn't just have to be for laughs either, right? It can, as I mentioned, crying, squirming, catching your breath, whatever. You can look for moments that will lead to something more serious or more touching. Recently on our third guest interview for my now third show, The Owl Podcast, again, it's filled with two W's and two L's, I had on a friend of mine, Andrea Ocampo, to discuss her expertise in PR and NFTs, among lots of other things. She's a marvelous woman to watch. <laughs> and a fun fact is that she was also my second podcast guest ever, 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 way back on episode two of Curve the Cube in 2014. So in doing my research to interview her, yes, I researched my own friends. <laughs> In doing that research, I decided to go back and listen to that interview with her back in 2014. And in listening back, I found a really special moment and I pinned it off to the side, hoping that I could work it into the interview. And the perfect opportunity came up as we were interviewing her just recently. And so I set it up like this. I said, back in 2014 on Curve the Cube, I asked you, what makes a strong independent woman in 2014. And your answer back then was a strong independent woman is being free, being free in terms of financially living your dream and doing whatever the hell you want without having to answer to anybody, what your heart desires and not really having any doubts or any fear to hold you back. It's harder to achieve, but being independent is really being able to live your bliss though sometimes to get there is a little challenging. Unquote. Do you still feel that way about what being an independent woman is today? That was the moment I set up. That was how I delivered that moment within the context of that interview on the OWL podcast. And guess what? She teared up. It honestly ended up being a powerful moment for the both of us. And I can't wait for you to hear it <laughs> when we begin to read those OWL podcast episodes. But it was a really moving moment. And it wouldn't have happened had I not had it pinned off to the side and ready for me to bring in at the perfect opportunity. Now, for unprepped for moments, my advice is similar to what I just laid out for you for prepped moments, but you just have to listen even more for those because they will be spontaneous and completely unexpected. So creating great interview moments out of unprepped for moments is even more reason for you to be as fully present in the conversation as possible. And when your guest brings up something, let's say super unique or impressive, Lean into it and ask for more details. Oh, you were the youngest staff writer ever hired? Was that intimidating or empowering when you first started? Or if they bring up something that you can relate to it, then relate to it right there on the show. Oh my gosh, that is my favorite horror cult flick too. Or if they bring up something that you vary greatly on in your opinions, dig into that more. Just on this one in particular, don't accidentally make the conversation about you by stating your opinion too much. Instead, say, oh, you went to my rival high school? Grrr. <laughs> or you led the student Republican club in college? That's hilarious. When I was in college, I was a president of the student Democrat club. How funny. Or whatever, and just see what happens in that point of the conversation. But whether it's something you can relate to or you differ on, you've just created a moment in your interview with that guest that in itself is unique to your interview with that guest. 
All right. Three more areas for me to focus on with you today in order to help you create great interview moments, making hard pivots, letting a question go, and knowing when and how to end the interview. So when it comes to making hard pivots in a conversation, the trick is finding a good segue. And there are a few different ways to accomplish that. My personal favorite, but also the harder one for me to pull off, truthfully, is finding something in common between the moment that just happened and where you want to go. But it's my favorite kind of pivot because it's not only the least jarring for the listener and the guest, but also it creates an opportunity for you to look super clever in front of your guests, which will either make them laugh or make them impressed or both. And that further greases the wheels for a well-flowing conversation. But like I said, it can be the hardest type of pivot to make. So if, for example, you've been talking about your guest's childhood growing up in a foreign country and you want to move forward to a more current part of their story, you might say something like, did that transition for you when you eventually moved from Brazil to the U.S.? Was there anything you learned from going through that experience that then helped you as an adult when transitioning from one career to something so drastically different? Or if you're talking to someone about their research into a life-saving medication and you want to move into their love of rebuilding classic cars, I know you're like, Jemmy, these could be two more different things. <laughs> Bear with me. You could say something to the effect of, are you a natural problem solver or love puzzles and things with lots of moving parts that have to work together in order to work right? Because I notice that when you're talking about your research, you talk in terms of how the different systems of the body have to work together. Is that also the draw for you for something like fixing up classic cars and having to get all those different systems to work together? Do both those things excite you for the same reason? Now, I realize that probably sounds super out of left field to you right now as you hear me giving it as an example. But I'm telling you, when I've made connections for guests like that, that seems super random to anybody else. But to the guest, it's almost always something that gives them an in the moment epiphany, aha, realization about themselves. And you almost can't beat that on an episode. It's really cool when I can make that happen, when I can link two moments or aspects of a person's life that they never themselves really thought of as being connected before. But voila, <laughs> you've created a fantastic and possibly very moving moment with your guest on the show. And now you can talk freely about that second area of conversation because you successfully transitioned into it. And the other approaches to making hard pivots are the more traditional shifts. So there's the total pivot when you just want to transition into something. So you might say, I'll next want to focus on dot, dot, dot. And in fact, you've heard me do something similar on this show, but for a different reason. When the episode I have coming up for you the following week has nothing to do with the episode you're currently listening to, I'll say something like, well, on the next episode, I'm going to switch gears and turn our focus to dot, dot, dot. Then there's also the choice of saving something that you want to make a hard pivot to for the end. You can say, before we wrap up, there's one more thing I wanted to ask you about. And finally, you may want to make a hard pivot when referencing a moment from earlier in the conversation that you want to circle back to. This may have been a moment of relation or some other interest that came up for you at some point early in the conversation, but there just wasn't a good opportunity or opening for this other question or this other thought that you had at that moment, but a better moment presented itself later. And so when the moment does present itself again, you can say something like, now, you've mentioned something like that before, and I wanted to get back to it because I thought it was really, really interesting. Or you can say something like, when you were speaking earlier about thus and such, you had a similar hesitation in your voice that I noticed, and I wanted to ask you about that. So you can use a hard pivot to revisit an earlier part of the conversation when a question came up, but it just wasn't the right time. And that brings me to my second to last area of discussion for today letting a question go. I mean, in the moment, if you can make a pivot back to it, go right ahead, knock yourself out, do it. But ultimately, you just really need to be honest with yourself as to whether the opportunity for that question has just simply passed. 
would it be more beneficial for your listener if you tried to shoehorn it in or would it make things feel really awkward and clunky or even cause the conversation to grind to a screeching halt because the moment has so passed <laughs> that asking your question would now be off-putting? There's no clear-cut answer. It's so case-by-case, case, but with practice, you'll be able to process those decisions in the moment more and more fluidly, especially because... As each time those decisions are made, you'll see what reaction you get, and that'll influence your decision-making in those moments with each future guest. As another option to circling back at any future point in the conversation when you can make it happen, alternatively, you can mention a dangling question in the closing wrap-up of your episode. So if you did let a question go, and you do a wrap up. And if you think that it was a question that your audience may wonder why you didn't ask it, and now it's just hanging out there for your listener, like a stinky fart. And da, da, da. <laughs> In the closing wrap up of your show, again, if you do one, then you can say to your listener something like, I really wanted to dive deeper into what my guest mentioned about her dad, but the moment passed and I couldn't find a good time to bring it up again. It would have felt super weird, but man, do I wish I knew what had happened there. Then end with a tease. But that just gives me a reason to have her back on again on a future episode. And I will definitely, definitely be asking her that question. So don't stress too much about it is my point, right? Remember that if you had a question and you just couldn't work it in, don't worry about it. And unless you really feel like it is hanging out there like a fart, you need to address it in the clothes, just let it go. Keep in mind that no one knows what wasn't in the episode. No one knows what questions you thought to ask and wanted to ask, but you didn't get to. So don't put too much stress on yourself to get every question in or judgment on yourself when you don't. A friend of mine named Bruce, who is the host of The Fittest Fat Kid, you know, a podcast that he had me on as a guest for a few months back, he did a marvelous job of putting a pin in a question, doing some decision making in his head during the course of the conversation as to whether or not he should bring it back up, he should circle back to it. Because when the topic first came up, it just wasn't the right time for him to ask a deeper question about it. And I was in the middle of a part of my story, so it, he had to just kind of let it go. But then he did find a good time to circle back to it. And it was done so delicately and so artfully. It really stood out as a great interview moment from a time when I was a guest. So, of course, I'll put a link in the show notes for you to that episode so you can check out his interview of me and how he revisited a question. And when you hear it, you'll know exactly is the moment I'm referencing. All right. And last but not least, you also need to know when and how to end the interview. We have all been at a party or a business event or something like that and are having a conversation with someone you don't know very well. Maybe it's even the first time you've met them. And there's a point in the conversation when you just feel like it's over. <laughs> It's time to hopscotch to another hapless soul at that mixer. And you start planning whatever line you're going to use for your escape. Oh, I see my friend over there from college. I better go say hi. Or, well, I'm pretty thirsty. I'm going to go grab a drink. Or, oh my God, my ex is here. Gotta go. <laughs> whatever it is, you have that feeling when you know the conversation is done, all that it's going to do or is supposed to do. And then you have to tap into a skill to gracefully exit that conversation. We've all done it. Guess what? It's the same feeling for realizing and then ending an interview. Remember, an interview is just a conversation after all. So you've done this before and you can do it again. But pro tip, when you're prepping for your guest interviews, think about what discovery you're looking to make or what answer you're looking to find. In other words, what you're trying to accomplish with that interview. Really think about what point you're trying to get to. Then as you're prepping, imagine coming to that point in the conversation and jot down a few options for your future self for good ways to end the interview. You might say, 
Well, I think the most incredible part of your journey is just how much when you really look back at it, it was influenced so much by your childhood dreams. And it's been wonderful to unpack that with you today. Or, well, if there's one clear bottom line for my listener to take away from this conversation today, I think that was it. You've been a fantastic guest. Think about those things as part of your prep routine. What's the objective of your interview? And what might be a way to end it? Then when you find that your objective has been met, the lesson has been learned or the story has been told or whatever, it's time to end the interview. Then, as I mentioned on the previous episode, give them that opportunity to self-promote and to share how people can connect with them or get in touch with them or get their services or whatever. And then thank them for joining you and say goodbye. Easy peasy. (laughs) And here's a good time to actually mention a golden rule of podcasting. Do not drag on an interview for time. You will lose your listeners. It gets boring. (laughs) Don't do that. Get in, create great moments by saying what needs to be said and asking what needs to be asked, and then get out. And apparently, I did a great job interviewing a dear friend of mine named Charlotte, who was a badass paraequestrian and joined me on an old show of mine, People of Florida. And the reason I believe I apparently did a good job on that one is because I received so much feedback on that interview in terms of my interview approach and being in the moment than on any other interview I've ever done ever. (laughs) So I'll link to that interview in the show notes for you as well. So check out Bruce's interview of me and my interview of Charlotte in order to bring a lot of what I've talked about here to life. But remember, there's nothing more important than what I already told you on the last episode. Listen, listen, listen. Oh, and practice, practice, practice. And as a quick reminder, I want to tell you what is now available on your favorite podcast player, my newest show, The Owl Podcast, which I mentioned briefly earlier. Remember, it's spelled with two W's and two L's, and I'm proudly co-hosting it with the founder of The Owl app himself, my friend, Mr. Jason Hill. And as you've heard me mention a time or two on this show, The Owl app connects you to professionals through live, private, one-on-one audio calls, and it's built to help you seek or provide advice. And if you're an advice provider, guess what? You get paid for it. (laughs) So the experts on the Owl app are masters of their fields, and they are now joining Jason and I to explore how to develop your expertise. They'll define being an expert in what they do and give you those tools so you can further define and go after becoming the expert you want to be. All of their insights will be revealed on the OWL podcast. So you'll want to listen into that show so you can connect, learn, and grow in your own expertise and knowledge. And then download the OWL app, again, also spelled with two W's and two L's, and monetize your own expertise. Let people pick your brain after they have picked their payment method. Sign up with my referral code PL954123 and get your $10 credit. Then look up the new OWL podcast right after you finished up this episode and the latest episode of my other other show the podfest podcast just released over the weekend so that's out for you with great podcasting tips from me as well and my co-host on that show is the glenn the geek who gave me daggers but we get along i'm still his co-host he's still working with me Up next on episode 53, I'm going to flip the script a little bit and give you some notes on solo episodes. So if you're not subscribed, be sure you do. And you can meet me on the OWL app for a one-on-one call about your podcasting questions. But until then, I have a whole host of free tips for you on my website. Just check out flintstonemedia.com slash free tips. Thanks for tuning in to Podcasting Your Brand. In this chapter of the show, I'm revealing how you can harness the power of podcasting and expand your brand. So come and pick up what I've been putting down since 2014. Avoid common mistakes and propel your podcasting and branding forward. If you have questions or are interested in becoming a sponsoring brand of this show, you can reach out to me anytime at Jemmy, spelled J-A-I-M-E, at flintstonemedia.com. Well, it's producer Jemmy signing off for now. Remember, the only thing more powerful than your voice is your spirit to use it. So turn that mic on. <laughs> <laughs>